And I am Tommy <coughs> Waffle Renshaw. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm a writer, editor, and cultural producer, raised in Edinburgh, and currently based in Brussels, where I'm studying an MA in cultural studies. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. This is my first time in the borders, um, I'm ashamed to say. Um, so it is really nice to be here in Hoyk, especially joined by this wonderful panel for today's event broadcast, which is about Scotland's languages. And today we'll be considering the experiences of working in multilingual communities, prioritising minoritised languages and embracing languages other than English as a vibrant influence in our community and creative lives. We're going to do this event in two parts um, with a little break in between before we can really get into the discussion. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel and they're also going to give us a short opener um, in a language of their choice. So we have two cultural collective projects represented, represented here today. Ghazi Hussain from Art27 in Edinburgh and Artir Donald, a Gaelic artist in residence at Highland Cultural Collective. So Artir, would you like to give us your opener? Yeah, well, I guess I'll start with I'm a small, white, Scottish man with a red face, and uh, he, him. Feskirma Gaif Ule. Is Misha Arshir Donlach, Agus Hamia Goper, Marniach Drama, Erwinchers, Marfarsh, Skipa, Kohoman Kulter, Nikel Dach, Agus Shinya Marfarsh, and Homan Kulter Nashinta. Ku Istrachuk. Hamisha Hokel on the Aja Grianach Bria. Elen Hirig als een eentje gaal, voor een rosloog, de schech keert geleed. De de haas ik mee zijn skaal. Je oké weer? No, is oké, kan je. De de haas ik mee zijn skaal, voor een vachtel pjeer de akkel. Je gaal ik kanen me geldig en geschen en akkel. Hoe ik mee kan neem, me beer de Engelse gemaal loe, je weet wat je rakel heb jillig. Ach, gevars nog, ha wie me fijn en belt als een klecht me goed je gaal ik, Maar de hacher in mijn wagen is gelauw elle aan de koeken en de zeesketen. Ze dramen ook madden, maar een slier opbracht waar met alle lenten naar mijn weg. Is maar schoon, hij meer wie kopper aan een theater, radio, television, eigen film, zo'n barak met tricket, Leona. Kreetjes in mijn jede, meer die Queen of Scots, van een eigen comedy show, oer, o, mograg. Het haar elle zat om die, wie een stuurde boetje opbracht, eigen jaden gloeik, Ni skallerin, djeterin, agus kajers nöken gaelik, harish ni priamachin. Smarsin, si urum vor haongo, a vienam farsh in kohomen kultur nashinta. Vien nopad gam harsher feis galchin, agus kajers nöken ansi geeltach, skire gama farshin a skachtje. Ni vi brien rikard in a geeltach, is kam farsh gin illa ansi frajikt, hain chin nöken skiren, a gero na feimlach gin, a smoch. Si amen sin nopad gam a vien brosnachu skallerin, is djeterin, Geharig de Wicklerke is een lissige Egalikerke, is Tokisha Mischnerk aan een Almerie Tscherk. Wie met Kopper Geharig de Eikri Gaal en Maag er Taar Gaalik trai Covid, Geharig van de Gelgaalik aan zijn Tajarke. En de Gelijking Eif, hoop Jastjach is Bajach zijn Hanen Agus en Doges. Kutjach bij Mekins Gaalik met een Karmen Opperge Hanen Zul de Gaalik. Skek bij Deunje Kursiers er Gaalik, bij Taar Deunje de Beerle en Kopper aan zijn Zul de Gaalik, Agus a Gianno Joe Hosner. In Drasde, Hami a Gopper on a Skulchin on the Malik, a Aracle Agus Lochapper. Hami Torstaich a Skullerin on the Art Skull Malik Agus Lochapper. A scriptic in a scriver, a son Philum Gurich. A seat a Christian, a son of Farpish Nashenta, Philum G. A shark could hurlish a skill in scrivy, a slaver jacket. Is a tuckle, mishnyak, big, a big. A mi cuddioch y tos taich y sgolar yn clas un gytri ac ys clas cihir y sierch ond y bwn sgol y charico. A sy'n ysgrif y pantomime ys ŵr ys o'n gach clas hych i'r dych lara ys y faich na pardd yn sgil o gydnolog i'r YouTube o'r hynny'n cyd ag pardd yn ôl ystoi yn y sgol chyn hast. Be fôr hwch chyn ôpar y tachas o'n ysgir yn gwchol ffarn a chyllyn ŵrit ddy gyrysyn i'r corfyn. Le hych dolch o sinema, theater a mor snaf ys eilid. 
Die Wahrheit gibt mir Kopf an der Skalchen, bei mir vier hundert Kernlichen, ich nehme nur die Innerwich, ich habe es gerade drei Sessionen, ich habe es frickerig, es kutsch für ja. Man riecht ein paar klassischen Gallik, tausch ich bin ur Drama Kajerschnach, nur rücken, ich will ui ach geheim. Bei einer Karmenschen Femel, in der Herren, nahm ich mir Kopf an der Skiere, für den Tal Döne, in neu, in Gallik. Schau für den Duen. Als ein Skiere schau, hat Barach wie an der Öhn et Gallik, Na ha ons en skalt bjöde. Die aarde wil toegt om ons bjöde, en spaar het dan die aalik, kei die bloed ne bjöde, tietjer, en jou lee hietjer. En schal een keel gekke wil vjoeing te vaarnten, ge maar vijg, en ze het kudde gudde et galik, en ze toegt om een maag en ze geene. En je soeie ge maar een haal, en ze bij me kurtaai, en ze is een lee inewig, en ze tietjer, trui fiestig ge, en ge draag rood te haal, en die daar gane maag. Haar ons gesein ze kien ze jonker de rut ma haal, ag is gudel klerke barach je jannache. Kutjach kane sasse tres kanen eunser. En je droch rut ta schön. Wie nou ik de kien ze gaap bi bucht ne bjöl e kursier ze regalig ag is het harring aste me je. Wie mi nou ik de wie praasel ag is laadje me in de skillen a hake. Wie mi schel te kien wil boog ons gulle kanen ag is ne gud bjöl ag oon kanen e maache barach Na schärk miele kanen, et fe en hö. Tach. Thank you, Arthur. Um, Gazi is now going to perform something. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity to speak and read the poem. But first of all, I would like to Thank you first and thank Art 27 as an artist in residence in Art 27, which Robert and Helen, uh, our uh, organizer for this uh, organization, which give, give us freedom and space and give us voice to celebrate and uh, practice our culture and language. So I'm going to read a poem called Return the Dream in Arabic. Sa'udu wa abda wa'udati khutan ala wajhi sabahi ila al-fajr thumma ila laylin nasitu fihi hilmi sahdihi baqaya al-umr wa kulla dumu' wa arfa'u lil mawti raya tasilmi wa aj'alu min jasadi rasifa ya samin yamtadu min hijrati ila atraf qaryati liya'abura shawqi ila hudni ummi wa asna'u min dulu'i zanabiq ومن لوعتي أبن الجسور ليعبر قلبي نازفا عطر الزهور يكفن الموت ويلغي القبور ويخضر دمي وأشدو بلحن رخيم حزين ألام شعبي فتدمع عيني وحول العيون ويلتم شملي وأرسم الوداع على وجه الحبيب نجوما تشع بأنوار حبي وأحبو وأحبو حتى الوصول وأطبع نفسي عند النزول قبلات على أقدام أمي Jamie and Harry just mean I haven't forgotten about you, but I just wanted to chat to Art here and Gazi a little bit because you're both um, the cultural collective projects. So, um, Arte, Arte, how is your project going so far? It's okay. So, <laughs> well, yeah, it's going well. I think uh, we're right in the middle of it. I think we're seven weeks in. To, so my main thing is working with schools and helping young people and students who um, lost out in their Gaelic education, really, uh, especially those that don't have any Gaelic at home. So I've been in the schools now for seven weeks and working in different projects. Um, some it's acting for camera lessons and using Gaelic. And the younger ones were writing uh, pantomime scripts in a haraco, uh, one for class one to three, 
and one for class four to seven. So that's interesting. But that, as I said earlier, was that you can't just send away for an English, like you can send away for an English pantomime. We don't have the same resources in Gaelic, mm -hmm. so it's easier for us to write one, and then it comes from the, the young people's own ideas. So it's local, and um, I think this, it helps their writing skills and their speaking skills a lot more than just something that's already written. Yeah. And it also gives them more ownership, which yeah. I think makes them more proud. So we're very happy with that. We're just at the stage now of getting ready in another week of rehearsals, I think, and then two weeks of filming. Nice. Um, and kind of on location with those pupils. So we're going to the local garage where they'll try to fix Santa's sleigh that's <laughs> crash-landed <laughs> and <laughs> things like that. So he's crash-landed in the Haracle and people aren't going to have Christmas, so there's a race against time. To uh, And that's all their own kind of ideas, and I prefer much more that than coming in and saying, this is what we're doing, mm -hmm. and as I say, they, they have more fun with that yeah. and, and do it. So at that stage, we're quite well on. Uh, in Malig, we've had a, f a few sessions there with pupils, and they were more about making a public information video about uh, the tourist season okay. and uh, camper vans, uh, parking in front of their gardens and things like that. So more a, a kind of awareness of where you park your uh, vehicles. And things. It. But it's quite interesting <laughs> that somebody in Primary 7 feels quite strongly about camper yeah. vans parking in front of their garden just because it's right in front of the sea there I mean, at Malig. Yeah, I can imagine that's a, that's a huge problem. <laughs> um, and what's the response been like? How are, they, are like, the kids and the pupils enjoying it? Are they excited about it? Or have there been kind of like any hesitation? What I've found is that some schools, um, so up in the Highlands, we still have the, in some of the schools, most of the schools, you still have to wear masks mm -hmm. when you're teaching. So I found that I haven't been teaching properly, I guess, for almost two years with the pandemic. Um, and then first time teaching, <laughs> my glasses on, everything was steaming up. So that wasn't, <laughs> didn't look very professional, but I soon got used to that and got around it. And I think, so at Malig High, uh, High School in the primary school, they find it harder to... Um, be flexible in bringing you in. Whereas the Haracle's kind of opened up its arms and will mm -hmm. take me as many hours as possible. I think they see it, I think all schools find it's a very positive impact. But Haracle, I think, uh, sees all kind of, they've got music tutors in there too. And what you might be halfway through your rehearsal and the tutor will come and take a boy or a girl away for 10 minutes, 15 minutes to do the recording or pipes or whatever. So it's, it's full on. And I quite like the fact that the uh, they're well into the arts because not everybody will be good at maths mm -hmm. either. So I quite yeah. like that. So they have opened their arms up, and there's a real positive uh, atmosphere in the whole nice. place. And to be fair, that there's a twelve, I think twelve speaking English pupils in that school as well. Um, the numbers have overtaken in Gaelic. So I've also okay. done workshops with them because uh, I think uh, although they're not studying Gaelic, they're well aware of it. They're very open to it, and they're happy to learn a few Gaelic phrases. And they've enjoyed the games and the exercises. So it's not a case of being and leaving them out because they're not speaking. It's all about sharing together. And I think, yeah, they've, it's just a great school, to be honest. Yeah. And Malik's also wonderful. Just to, it's harder to make enough time, I guess, just because of facilities and resources. But, but yeah, the pupils are loving it. I think so. You'd have. To, I always say you have to ask them. But I think <laughs> they always say they always say Matting va Arthur. They always say Good morning, Arthur, when I arrive. So I think. At least they're glad to see me. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, a, good, that's a good start. It's not, oh no, it's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, and I suppose you mentioned some of the challenges, but have there been any other challenges, I think, of this project? Were you, or did you have any hesitations before going in and embarking on them? Well, I guess the only thing is Highland region, as I said in my opening, well, uh, I don't know if you saw the subtitles, but Highland region is a large region and well spread. So I guess you can't possibly cover the whole lot, but what we've done is broken it into four terms. And at the moment, we're kind of at the west. A next term will be in the middle, I guess, of Inverness Shire, and then we'll be in the east, and then the last term will be up north in Sutherland. So even the more rural areas will get some of my time. And hopefully, one of our other Highland Culture Collective uh, colleagues, Sinead O'Hargan, is up there, and maybe it'll be a chance for us to work together with some of the school pupils. And that would be quite good as well. <clears throat> I think as part of the collective, it, it's funny being part of the collective, but also being by yourself up, up in those country roads. Mm -hmm. So it's good to be here and actually and meet people today and actually, yeah. oh yeah, I am part of the collective. Yeah. So if that makes sense, you know, I think others are out by themselves too. And uh, yeah, so, so far so good, I think. Good. Thank you.
and now to yeah your fellow fellow network part of your network Gazi um how's your residency going it's going very very good yeah because we work as a team in this R27 and everybody support uh, the other person and uh, support in the community and we get support from the community around us. And about, uh, we have so many projects in the organization going on and I like do something in that project which teaching Supposed to be a poetry for survival, but now I start with the calligraphy workshops, which is going good, I think. It's the feedback I get from the parents more than from the kids is good. Uh, the kids is very shy to say things, but... So they keep well, coming back? The kids keep coming? Yeah. Yeah, still. So they they still come, in, come in and increase the, the number, which yeah. is uh, encouraging. Yeah. 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 And what kind of calligraphy? Uh, I done Arabic calligraphy with okay. them and English. They are preferring English, but we try to concentrate in Arabic because the language is very important. Is The language for any person is like the identity of the person because yeah. if I'm in the street I hear somebody speaking Scottish or Gaelic I say that he's a Scottish I identify that person and they say the tongue, your tongue is your address if I hear Glaswegian I, oh, he's from Glasgow I he's a Scottish from Glasgow then and that's our words is like our mirror yeah. so reflecting our culture our education our politics our morality as well yeah. so i i think we try hard with robert and helen and the other artists to support this kind of um crucial things in people's life yeah. so but my experience and in, as a, you know, when as a person who had, um, my English used to be very, 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 very bad. Mm -hmm. Nowadays is very bad. Just, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, and when I is my experience, I'm going to speak about my experience because we speaking about language and language is very important. So my experience here is. Uh, my problem used to be w because I don't talk. Yeah. I'm afraid to talk. That's half of my problem. The other half of the problem, when I talk, because I say things different than what I meant to say. And people misunderstand. And that misunderstanding between me and the other person is make a distance, distance of misunderstanding. And that distance is very difficult to cross it. Mm -hmm. uh, because people will accuse you you are stupid because you don't understand. And that is cruel. Yes, I know is stupidity is a talent of misunderstanding, but I'm not a stupid. I have a funny stories, if you want to, me to just tell the stories about misunderstanding. Okay. Uh, I, when I came, I just like have a problem with my accommodation because it was in my YMCA and it was very crowded. And I go to complain, I go to Scottish uh, refugee council, the only place you can go to and complain. So I went there and I, am, I used to have a, a book a dictionary, small dictionary. I don't have like five English words I know. Yes, no, okay, thank you, bye. That's what I know. So I have that uh, book a dictionary and I went shouting at the refugee council in Arabic. And a woman came from the office. I remember her name, Charlie. She said, Gazi, calm down. I take my dictionary, open it, look at it, 
and I went down the stairs. <laughs> I, I found I, myself in the toilet. I said, why she sent me the, and the to, to the toilet? I don't need a toilet. I need an accommodation, other accommodation. I went up again and start shouting more and more because when there's misunderstanding, your voice going higher and higher and higher. So I start shouting more. And she came out again and she said, Gazi, calm down. I said, you are a liar. I've been down. <laughs> Why you send me this toilet? And that is the misunderstanding. She's, I think she was very helpful. At the end, I found out she's very helpful, but because the misunderstanding make a big gap between yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, another Thank story you. you would like to I mean, I could listen to your stories all, all day, right. but... <laughs> I, I, I went back <laughs> because I like telling these stories. It's funny, but because of misunderstanding, I, yeah. I, it's important to uh, say. I went back to YMCA where I live, I used to live, and the YMCA was very crowded. And when you call the left, you need to wait about 15, 20 minutes for the left. I was standing on the front of the left, and the Scottish guy came with a big black dog. And I tried to avoid the dog because I go, I, it was cold, and uh, I want to go to pray. If the dog touched me, I have to wash again. So I avoid to... And the guy look at me at the face and he think I'm just uh, being bad to the dog. He said the fa of word to me. I don't know what it is. I take my dictionary, look, look, look. Doesn't have that word. <laughs> uh, and I looked at, at him and I start using my cleverness, my smart, I have all smart I am. I figure it out. I said, oh, I remember Russian names. Russian names end with Ov, Olivet, Klashenkov, Dikterio, <laughs> Kharashov, Gorbachev. I, I, I look at him, I said, well, I'm not Russian. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Fa in black. So I didn't know what it is. My dictionary again, and doesn't have that word. So I start to figure it out, and I look to the dog, I said, my the dog name is that. Uh, in. I said, oh, you, you have a big uh, in, in your flat. We're not allowed to have one like this. I, I thought that that's where is the name of the dog. So that's a misunderstanding. <laughs> he looked at me again and said, stupid. The only words I found it in my dictionary <laughs> is stupid. And I said, the stupidity is the talent of misunderstanding. And that's where it's, you know, it's, I, I, I think it's very important to just be a peaceful friend to other person to, to understand or just leave the other person in peace. Yeah. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There is lots of things you said that you both said actually that I want to um, come back to after our break. But before we have a break, um, we've got two more panel members, two more spe very special panel guests here with us today. Um, so, Harry Josephine Giles is a writer and performer from Orkney, living in Leap, and their verse novel, Deep Wheel Orcadia, was published by Picador in October 21. Like, it's a month old. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, Harry Josephine, would you like to share your opener with us? Yes. Um, just before the opener, a visual description. I'm a, a tall, white trans woman or Utwether in Scots with uh, mid length brun hair, mm -hmm. Rafsi. Um, I'm wearing a white t shirt with a Frida Kahlo print and a black skirt and cellar hoops in my lugs and a steel necklace uh, with a tour card for the tarot on it, which it's maybe a bit of a risky emblem to wear, but it's the mood that I'm in. So, <laughs> um, My name's Harry Josephine, Josie for short, and I'm a writer and performer for Orkney, the Northern Isles of Scotland. 
The language I'm speaking now is Arcadian, the Orkney dialect, and it's the language of me islands. It's a dialect of Scots with guy strong influences for Old Norse. About half the folk at home speak it as a first language. That's 10,000 folk. And just about everybody in the islands understands it. That's the strongest density of Scots anywhere, along with Shetland and the Doric and Aberdeenshire. Well, in Orkney, we don't fairly think of it as a dialect of Scots, but just its own thing. Linguistically, it is a dialect of Scots, but for whatever reason, history or culture or politics, Orkney has always had in itself a pet for Scotland. That marks a bit of a fankle or a phrase like Scotland's languages. What if me language is no awful keen on being Scotland's? <laughs> what if most folk that speak it do not think of it as a proper language, but just the way we speak? I'm gotten a PhD in minority language literature, and one of the things I researched was who national languages in Europe has always been mad through empire. But standard language is a tool of colonization, and languages like English or French is always mad by centralized power to exclude the periphery. Do we want Scots? to try and do the same thing, or no? Is it another way of thinking about language? No is one fix-it thing, but a spectrum of ways of speaking, it's all deserving of support. Yin's the question I'm bringing the day. Whatever poor does, there's I fuck it'll do the own thing with words and mark their own thran poor that way. Thank you, Harry, Josephine. And now, Jamie Ria, who is going to also introduce themselves. Hello and thank you. I want to start off by giving a visual description of myself. I am a white male, a queer person, with ginger hair and a ginger beard, and I've got a Scottish tartan cap on with a shirt that's kind of like a photograph of a building that's kind of been taken, you've taken the colours out of it, and I have striped blue trousers on as well. I grew up in Northern Ireland and moved to Glasgow in 2015. I am one of the first cohort in the RCS in a course called Performance in uh, BSL and English. I graduated in 2018 and I'm a BSL user. That's my first language. Since graduating, I have started to um, and I started an explorative progress uh, process in all different forms of art, um, as a performer, as a producer, as a creator. In July the year to October, I also worked with Squiff in creating, for the first time, um, some films for them. And I'm also a BSL consultant, so I work with theatres mostly. I want to say how honoured I am to be part of this conversation today. For me, I feel a real connection to the subject, the title, because of the artistic work that I do and the community that I'm from, I feel that it's a huge part of it. I am a bilingual person and I'm also part of the artist community. So I'm in quite a unique position, I think, that way, but it's a strength to be able to represent both of those communities equally. I feel that it's important that BSL is centred within our industry and that I want to be a huge part of that going forward because deaf people 
BSL users in our community find their motivation. And it's really important for them to be able to see themselves represented within the industry, you know, and on panels like this with people like you, um, for us all to be able to share that and to be represented together. I want to make sure that I'm part of that contribution as we go forward. So thank you for having me today. Thank you, Jamie, for your introduction. Loved it. Um, Harry, Josephine, I wanted to ask you, just thinking about what you just said in your opener, and um, you mentioned how whatever power does, there there are always people who will do their own things with words and make their own dissident power that way. And it just, because I got to read it before, it made me think of like how words obviously have power and the languages words are spoken and heard and have power too. And do you think for someone who is bilingual, in Scotland, does the power of your words, or how does the power of your words change depending on the language you're speaking? Well, that's a big question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think the truth is that most folk are bilingual in one sense or another, or maybe more accurately, I think most folk engage in code switching that most folk, even if they say they only speak one language, will have multiple registers of that language that they use in different places. Um, one version of it that they speak with their friends, one version of it that they use at work, one version of it that they use in their poetry or whatever. And we, we switch quite naturally between these codes. And for folk that have different language communities, whether that's Scots and English or any other kind of set of language communities that coexist, sometimes together, sometimes in conflict. That code switching can become very pronounced. And nationality or language community is one of the ways that that's pronounced. Um, class is another major way that that's pronounced. Um, with Scots especially, Scots is a, is a language that is often marked now in the 21st century is either working class or rural. It's not thought of truly that often as a national language that everybody in the nation speaks when, when folk open their mouth and speak Scots. Because of war, the strong language communities of Scotland are, it's thought of as a working class language or as a rural language or both. And that means that when you speak it, poor relations are there in your mouth as you're speaking. And we're all conscious of that. We deploy these poor relations. We use words and languages and codes to communicate to each other what our social positions are and, and what, why we think about each other. And that can come down to individual words. It can come down to, to prepositions. One of the things I think about Orkney often, and it's the same in Shetland, is that... Um, fairly uniquely, not entirely, but, but quite rarely among languages in these islands, Orkney maintains a distinction between the um, formal and the familiar second person pronoun. So the formal second person pronoun is you, as it is in English, but the familiar one that you use for folk that you're familiar with, with your family, with folk that are junior to you, is the um, which is the same as the Old English vow. It's the same thing. And it's it's not so common in Orkney anymore, but if somebody uses the with you, that <coughs> marks a social relation directly of, of what you think the poor between you is. And there's folk that I might use that with, and there's folk, especially folk that are older than me, I'd be very cautious of using the, even if they're using the with me. So even just doing a single word, we mark who we think about each other in social relation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Jamie, I mm. wanted to ask <coughs> you, because obviously you studied at RCS. Sorry. Um, Yeah, because you studied at RCS and then graduated and obviously now you've just curated 
for SQUIF, which is the Scottish Queer International Film Festival. And I wanted to know, um, is there a difference in communities, both hearing and deaf, are engaging with BSA, BSL film and BSL theatre? So are they are people more responsive to BSL film or are they enjoying it more? Or like, yeah, what are the differences? Well, I would say within BSL theatre, deaf audiences engaging with that feel that they're on a very familiar footing with the medium. Um I think if you have a hearing director or, you know, with a, a hearing theatre company, that's kind of why I became a BSL consultant. It's just simply that you might have a deaf performer on a stage who's being directed by a hearing director. And they don't have that same insight into the language and making sure that it's been well represented on stage. So they need a BSL consultant to connect with them, to allow the artist to focus on their work um, and their script development within their character, and for me to be able to focus on assessing that language as a director would, normally with a, a hearing cast member, because I'm able to have that eye. So from the insight, that's kind of where I, I see the importance of having BSL represented well so that deaf audiences can connect with that. If you then consider the process of film, if it's a deaf filmmaker who's filming a, a deaf artist or actor, they're going to represent BSL far more genuinely on film than what they will if it was a hearing person that was filming them. They would tell a different story almost as a hearing filmmaker than a, than a deaf filmmaker would do because they wouldn't have that, de that BSL eye, that BSL perspective culturally to know what works on screen for a deaf audience. Um, you know, there are differences between cultures as there are throughout the world. There are differences between cultures, there are barriers, there are journeys that we need to make between those differences. Um, and quite often, if a hearing filmmaker works within a deaf industry, it's the hearing person that then is left with the barrier and not the deaf people that are in that space. So I think each of those elements can give us different outcomes and audiences can receive that differently too. Um, if you ha if you're a hearing director who has deaf friends, you're going to have a better insight than somebody that is not part of that community. But yeah, that's where all that kind of comes together. Yeah, and what I'm hearing is that, or like, and what you're saying is that it's about what's happening in that creative process and how these how it's made is then how it influences how an audience can receive it. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we're going to get into a little bit more, but first, we're going to take a break for 10 minutes. But before we take that break for 10 minutes, um, Harry Josephine, would you like to read us a little bit from your novel, please? I will. Thank you. I will. <laughs> um, so just to set a bit of context, um, it's a science fiction novel in the Orkney language, in poetry, um, which is a, a bit of a pile-up of things. And I just wanted to read a couple of poems from it that engage with language as a question and engage with some of the things that I was just speaking about, this um, tension between codes. Um, I don't think you need to ken much. Um, the, the, one of the central plots is a love story between two characters, Astrid and Darlene. So the first poem is um, Astrid Tuck and Darling Home for Dinner. Um, and I'll tell you about the second poem before that one. Um, 
And I'm just going to read it in the in the Orkney. I think the subtitles are going to be in English. I think because I've sent it to them. But <laughs> we'll see. We There's English it. in the book, so if it, if it does not work, you'll just have to buy the book and get the English. <laughs> <there. laughs> Astrid tax darling him for dinner. This is my new friend, and the layers in friend. It's not fairly clear, and I'll no be explained. Darling is winsome now. She's something other as the scar thing of a tourist Astrid met. A smile in her fun tackled face, Rory Clays, at the midst of this family hits like her body is lowing. Maybe the thought of parents lunt at performance. With Darlene's silence about their own feathers, Astrid's hour thankful for her folks met in kindness, until fair into the meal she hears their vules rundin, their consonants clapping, their words switching to marry Darlene's own, and gets unspeakable barman. And when her own in as one, she sits quiet, wanting a body to notice, her mother to smile and say, but oh, and tuck her back to the old family table. But the help of oh, Astrid's silence, his awful gravity, and so the conversation is fagging, fun, is hearing itself is less and less real get done till it's just darling at smiling and specking yet. So that's your awkward dinner. <laughs> and digging more into the awkwardness, the other kind of central plot in the book is that this space station, Orcadia, which is almost but not entirely unlike Orkney, um, is gone through a bit of an economic crisis and this poem is about um, a, a young radical for the station called Brenna who is presenting her uh, theories on what to do about the crisis to the station's council which in uh, a Nordic tradition is called the Ting um, and this is who that goes down and again it's about the tension between different ways of thinking and different ways of speaking Young Brenna at the Ting. Brenna's speechifying. She chants about the inherent inequalities of the interstellar economy. What why the extractive industrial labour relations and light production now require a radical reimagination of Arcadia's poor. What why the FTL drive was no a threat, but an opportunity. To show the galaxy what white they work a better why. She speaks, Guy will. She has been practicing her arguments for weeks. Lass, thanks for that, says Un, the eldest there, and I, the chair they do not have. No, the stores. Had on! Brenna Golders, horrid read get in. Are we no gant to discuss what I'm speckin' about? Yes, yes, says Un, couthy and blind. Was got in something they're wantin' or needin' to say just now to bring us clever notions? The foul ha is dainty silent, and silent yet. Brenna did not ken to practice for this. An un is practised other life. Un hosts. No, the stores. Thank you so much, Harry Josephine. Yeah, that was really nice. It was really nice. And it makes me want to buy your book. So I think I'm going to have to go and do that. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> You've done excellent.
excellent promo. Um, amazing. We are going to come back in 10 minutes at my watch. is still in Brussels time, but I think 3 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Thank Hello. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> um, amazing. We're back. Um, cool. Thank you, everyone, so much for your, for your openers and your contributions and sharing your work with us before the break. Um, I've quite I've got lots of questions and points and things I really want to get into. And first, the first one is, so Harry Josephine, this is going to be a question for everyone, but um, Harry Josephine, you mentioned in your opener again, um, or you raised the question, is there another way of thinking about language, not as a fixed thing, but as a spectrum of waves of speaking that all deserve support. And so I wanted to ask to the panel, um, how do we begin to change how we think about language in Scotland? And I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> don't fix your plan B faster than your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you, sometimes people uh, create an idea about me, for example, and start bunching me for that idea without knowing who I am or who, who what I'm, and through language, I think you can explain yourself, your culture, your politics, your uh, human rights, your identity, and communicate with the other people. So I think um, is back to the understanding, I, and I think that's just to narrow that distance between people and make them uh, uh, more closer to uh, to make judgment about others. I think that's me, my answer to that. Yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you. It's like understanding and slowing things down and listening and. and Sorry, Gazi, were you going to say something? No. 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 Okay. Jamie? I think for me, and for the language I use, being BSL, and feeling how much support that receives in comparison to hearing people who might want to work with me or people that are just focusing on their own work, to think, first of all, in general social settings, BSL is represented, but it's often represented through um, a hearing interpreter connecting pe us together in a kind of triangle, you know, as a deaf person with a hearing person and an interpreter. And it's always okay to ask you know, I think that anybody that, that's sharing a space should feel they have the right to ask, what's the what's the word for this? What's the sign for that? And any language should be open to being interrogated and shared and should we should always be welcoming to each other, no matter what language we use. It's okay also to forget the next day. <laughs> um, I think it's as long as you always maintain an open mind and not just an open mind to ask, but also to receive. Regardless of the communities that we're in, we're going to always have differences within our community, you know, between our communities. And I think we find the common ground when we actually ask the questions of one another. Um, most of the time when I'm working, I'm working with hearing people. That's the majority of my work in life since I've moved to Glasgow. And what, what I really appreciate is when the people that I'm working with actually start to understand the importance of having an interpreter there and not just trying to get by um, or of trying to communicate directly with me when an interpreter isn't available, you know, and working towards using an interpreter less. 
Um, I think that COVID seemed to give people the time and space to stop and think about what is required for accessibility. And I think that it's become better. I think there seems to be more understanding, more general understanding about access and equality to a space. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I think um, a big part of the answer is in the education system and has to be. And I think in finding that, we have to start by th yeah. understanding that the British public education system was explicitly created to make these islands monolingual. That one of the functions of British public education was to establish English as the dominant and only language in these islands. And that from the start, the only other languages that were taught were first dead classical languages, which you know have their own role, and second, other languages of European colonization, like French, German, which again have their own role. But th th those methods were deliberately marginalizing minority languages within these islands, Scots, Gaelic, Welsh, Irish, um, that was very intentional, and also stigmatizing working class forms of speech and rural forms of speech. And that was very deliberate within the education system. So what we have to do now is to reimagine who language is taught in education. Some of that is straightforward in theory, although it takes a lot of reworking in practice, which is building multilingualism into education in these islands from the start. Multilingualism not just in Scotland's languages, but in all the languages that are spoken in these islands, in this place. So not just Scots, Gaelic, English, but also Arabic, Urdu, Polish, languages with big speaking communities that should be part of the way that folk think and speak in these islands. Um, so it's partly teaching multilingualism from the start, understanding that that strengthens education, that strengthens young folks' ways of thinking about the world and ability to move through the world, um, and it has benefits for other aspects of education. And then the other half of it is also removing this, this process of teaching proper English as central to the education system. It's a nonsense. It's used to, I, I like the fact that I can be flexible and, 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 and strong in English, but I want, I want folk to be proud of the different ways that they speak English, the dissident forms of English, and those should be celebrated and supported by a creative education, not forced out by a, by a forced monolingualism in education. Thank you, Harry, Josephine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, typical is the situation of Gaelic, for example, that is a curriculum based on an English curriculum. Therefore, parts of it will never work. Um, I guess things have changed. When my mother went to school, she got belted for speaking Gaelic. I've, and my father used to fight for Gaelic medium education, and they've come now, thankfully, and things have moved on. But again, going back to what Gazi said about um, understanding, I think sometimes when people, for example, whether it's Scots or Gaelic that they put down on, or Doric, what's the use of those? It's a, there's a f real fear there, I think, from people. And I think that comes down to understanding and education, as Josie said, to understand that we're all equal, just that we happen to speak different languages and uh, more languages we have and understand and share, the better. Thank you, Arthur. And Jamie, you were going to say. Everything that you're um, sharing is a similar reflection to what the deaf community have experienced in, in their education systems. You know, um, deaf people, I come from a deaf family, and we don't use English much. It wasn't until I went to school that we were taught in English. And that's the way that the deaf community have been taught for a long time. They've been forced to not use signed language, but to use an English spoken language or English written language. And it, when I was at home, I would be using BSL. But when I was at school, I'd be using sign supported English and almost losing some of the rules of grammar that I'd learned at home with the natural language development that I'd had there. And so... Not just that, but then being forced to speak and taught to speak. 
sometimes even been taught to speak French when really I wanted to be learning about the beautiful depths of BSL. In Scotland, there's the BSL Act, and I'm so pleased that that's there and that the community has the BSL Act and that it has been, um, you know, there is a, a plan to, to roll that out in schools more than what it currently is at the moment. I think there's such a huge um, need there, not just for BSL, but for the signed languages of France or Spain or other countries as well, and to keep the, the, the language relative to the person. I think that everything that you're saying there, it just reflects really strongly with me as well. It just resounds in, in my memory and experiences. And, and also children should have a right to choice. To choice of which language they would, they would like. You know, not just that a teacher is saying, you are here and I'm going to teach you French, for example, mm -hmm. when that's not the language that they really want to be operating in or, or learning about. There should be more uh, fight for rights for language. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, Arthur, you mentioned about your mother getting the belt for speaking Gaelic. Um, and now you're flourishing. Flourishing? <laughs> you're doing well in your career, I suppose. <laughs> flourishing in your career. Um, um, using the language and I wanted to know like are people is it um there was obviously a shift between your childhood and your mother's and in terms of the language and how it was received has there been another shift now or is it still the same as to when you were growing up I think it's constantly shifting. Yeah. yeah, as Jamie said, when I went to school, I had no English, but I very quickly had to learn English or I was going to get left behind. So I think at least I didn't get the belt, not for speaking Gaelic anyway. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so I mean, I think now, you know, we have Gaelic medium units throughout Scotland. In Glasgow, we have three primary schools feeding into the secondary school. Uh, and overall throughout Scotland, there's I get quite a demand for Gaelic education. I think the worry is there won't be enough teachers. So, mm -hmm. and I think, and uh, the Gaelic, the language itself has evolved as well to more, not what you'd call an RP, I guess, but more of a kind of standardised um, kind of way of speaking. Uh, for example, um, where I come from, Tyree, we use quite a lot of dialectual difference compared to the Isle of Lewis and different places. So I think the Gaelic's been standardised in schools now, so it's almost all the young people learn the same kind of one, one for fit for all. But I think that's a good thing about me out in schools is when, I, when I'm working with young people, I'll discuss the other words that you can use in different areas, because I think that's just as important to keep the richness of the language alive rather than make it this one bog standard kind of... Um, one fits all. Yeah, yeah. It's like the richness and the nuances mm -hmm. and the differences that make it that you want to preserve, right? That's yeah. like culture. That's yeah. how. You, yeah. I mean, the thing about the language now is it's it's you know it's in a healthy state, I guess. Um, and young people now, I guess, if they come from Glasgow, it's quite funny because they'll have a different accent from what I have, obviously, coming from the islands and the. And uh, it's it's evolving in that sense too that people around the world are learning Gaelic, you know, and they go to Sky to the college or different things. So I think the the, the blast, as they say, the taste or the, the dialectual taste you have is is possibly changing as well. But that makes it more interesting as well. That's, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, Gazi, you've mentioned a couple of times today about like language and how it shows your identity. Um, and can give clues to your identity or your history or your past or where you're from. And I wondered, coming to Scotland, how has your relationship to your first language of Arabic changed? Mm. It was difficult, but uh, you know, is there is a saying in Arabic said, when you know the language of your neighborhood, you avoid their devil act. That's one thing. And 
There's a, another saying, which is a good one, your language is your horse. Tie it well or ride it well. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think is the difficulties is, was disrespect. Uh, respecting costs nothing but mean a lot. Mm -hmm. But when you speak other language and people n not understand that, it's kind of, they feel you are like insulting them, mm -hmm. asking you to speak English, which is, I don't, I cannot speak it. I can uh, listen. And when I listen, I look to your face. Your face is smiling, and you will say yes. Whatever you say, it will be, I will say yes, yes, okay. But when you ch ch change your tune, I start saying no. No, that's, the, the, you know, the barrier. But is, there is, I think, crucial part in the, any communication is the respect there. If it's there, everything, we can communicate, even if we don't, uh, really have a common language. But if there's no respect, even if we have a common language, we're not going to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that, it's that respect, again, and the patience mm -hmm. to want to communicate and want to, to hear and speak to others. Um, we're almost at time. I've got like one more question, but I wondered if anybody in the audience has any questions for any of our panelists. Yes. Deserve, deserve the language. It's not just communication, it's the heritage of the language. Okay. Yeah, so catch me if I've got this wrong, but how um, preserving heritage and culture through language, is that, yeah? How do we do that? How, how important is that? I think you're right. That a language is a culture and a language is a cultural memory and a language is a way of thinking about the place and that's so true and important and is, is one of the many reasons for um, strengthening multilingualism, preserving threatened languages. I think also that a language is a way of thinking about the future and a way of creating the future. And I think these two things are part of the same picture. And the reason I, I emphasize the future and the reason for writing a science fiction novel is that often we think about um, threatened languages as, as dwindling and we think about them kind of in this temporality of the past, that especially like languages like Scots and also Gaelic, get persistently cast as languages of the past. So when we only speak about this is our memory, this is our history, sometimes we risk playing into that, which is not to disagree with you, but to say yes and these are ways of thinking about the future because there's words for future technologies in Scots. We have a word for wind turbines in Arcadian. We're a marine energy research centre in Orkney. Orkney is a way of thinking about the future because it's also got a language that carries a cultural memory and a past. Thank you. Harry, Josephine. Does anybody else have anything to add? Yeah, Jamie? I might be side-stepping a little bit from what we're talking about, um, but it is in relation to preservation of a language. In BSL, there has been you know, the evolution of language, um, BSL has expanded, has grown exponentially from years gone by when a lot of terminology was relayed by fingerspelling. There weren't 
the same pieces of vocabulary attached to that language. However, it was held in the body, it was held in the face, it was held in the culture, it was held in the, the way that language was relayed. And it's grown vo with its vocabulary over the years. So people are far more fluent with um, syntax and grammar than what they were in years gone by. To add on to the idea about two people that you were saying not understanding one another of respect isn't there. I think that point um, echoes in the deaf community as well. I think it echoes internationally. You know, um, there is no one internationally recognised signed language. However, you could meet somebody from Hungary as a deaf person and appreciate that you have different languages, but adapt your signed language to a more gestural international version of language and use visual cues and visual metaphors to get your point across far more easily than I think you can with spoken languages. And I remember going to Budapest from Ireland for a week. And I'd never met this person that I met in Budapest. And the sign language that they used, we first of all were working between ourselves with interpreters. And we were sitting watching the whole process between interpreters <laughs> And then eventually communicating with each other. And people were saying, have you two met before? And we were saying, no. But actually, there are there is power within a visual language um, and using um, visual markers within language to create a more international connection that sometimes isn't as easily done with spoken language. So there's a lot of power that we hold within our languages too. Yeah, I just add to that. I mean, going into the schools, I think very much, you know, Gaelic and Scots very much cast aside as, oh, it's dying. It's the absolute reverse is true, I think. When I go into the school and I work with those young people and say, what's the word for this? I go, oh, hang on a minute till I think of that. And then I'll think, about, and then uh, you, um, they go on and they've got the new word in Gaelic or whatever, and they can go, and they are the future. They are going to spread. And it's international now because we've got technology. Takes it, we, people will know there's only 60,000 Gaelic speakers, but there's 800,000 have visited Duolingo and so on, you know. And mainly, yeah. most there's over 7,000 languages over the world, and most of them have less than 100,000 uh, speakers. Uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and you can learn any language on it, so none of us have a reason to be uh, disrespectful or anything like that. So the youngsters are the future. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question from someone on Zoom. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Ariel Kilik. Kilik? Um, and they have asked, I love, and they've asked and they've commented, I suppose, I love how everyone is talking about respect diversity, listening to other people, and forcing people to change their language, etc. Would super love to hear the panel's views on forcing language and how that impacts women. How that impacts women. Mm. Does anyone want to... It's quite a big question. Can you repeat the question yeah, for me, please? Of course I can. I love how everyone is talking about respect, diversity, listening to other people, and forcing people to change their language. So, forcing people to change their language. Okay. Would super love to hear the panel's view on forcing language and how that impacts women. So I'm guessing by, f I'm guessing, assuming by forcing, that means if, like, if you don't have a choice, if you're in an environment where you can't speak another language, where people don't want to hear your language, or there's not that respect there, I think. That's also okay if nobody has an answer. No, there's, there's just so much I'd like yeah, to say. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. 
I'm thinking about the code switching that happens between yeah. gendered spaces. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking uh, about mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about who and I'm thinking about when I'm in a meeting and sometimes I'm often the only trans person in a meeting and often the only woman in a meeting. That happens to me a lot. And I'm thinking about, I was speaking with my mother about this just this week, about who, the ways that folk use language and social codes between themselves, the way that men use language and social codes between themselves to reinforce a brotherhood, to reinforce a particular kind of sociality, even when it's not intentional or even when the intention is, isn't spoken, how often that leaves me feeling on the outside of whatever conversation is happening. And I think about who, when I come into a space, I am often carrying the burden of representation, the burden where I'm supposed to represent a community, often a trans community or a queer community, which I absolutely cannot represent in any way, but I am the carrier of that community and of its language. And I have to carry kind of the heaviness of that on me and what words I choose to use, what things I choose to say, which is why I was just thinking about who do I answer this question? Because my gender is fraught in this space mm -hmm. and everything that I say can carries like the weight of that fraughtness which is extremely difficult so I suppose my answer to that is that sometimes I choose to reflect and adapt myself to the codes that are going on to like insinuate myself into the space and get things that I think I want or things that I want from my community say if I'm in a space with civil servants from the government and sometimes I choose to disrupt the dominant language of that space and insert into it words and thoughts and languages that that space does not want to hear so it's both of those things yes. thank you Harry Josephine Jamie I think I just wanted to to add to what you were saying, Josie. Um, I think giving the example of linguistic development in BSL with uh, gender and pronouns and other terms that are out with the binary. It's binary terms are so powerful. You know, even the sign in BSL for people is woman, man. That becomes the sign, people. And now you're seeing a lot of changes, like this sign for people, which is basically just showing the individuals. So that there isn't a control of gender there, or an inference of gender there. And that it's not about the binary, but it's about the human. And so those changes are happening within BSL in relation to gender, and those sign terms are developing, as they have with other languages. Thank you, Jamie. That also just made me think of how Harry Josephine said that um, Orcadian as a language can be the future and like the possibilities within BSL to keep redeveloping and reimagining as we add more words to our language right there's something really beautiful that you can that can happen there um that's us <laughs> I, was, I was gonna try and find a really nice way to say that but i i can't um thank you so much to our wonderful wonderful panel um it's been a really insightful conversation and i also kind of frustrating because I feel there's you've all got so much like experience and thought to share and we've hardly scratched the surface um but yeah thank you so much thank you to our audience at home at home on zoom and our audience here as well